In the 1890s, an industrial boom swept through Virginia, and a small town was being transformed into the iron center of America. It would be home to the grandest boulevard of the South. Its centerpiece was a beautiful steel bridge. Within a few years, the boom went bust. Over time, icons of the town's industrial days vanished, until only the bridge remained. After more than a century of use, the rusting relic was taken down piece by piece. But instead of becoming another lost treasure, a high-tech makeover restores the beauty of this Victorian lady. Spanning centuries, restoring a boomtown bridge. Places in Virginia can rival the natural beauty of Goshen Pass in Rockbridge County. The Maury River cuts its way through these mountains to create a gap that has led travelers upstream to a lush valley. Native Americans passed through the area for thousands of years in their hunt for buffalo, elk, and other game. Scots Irish and German pioneers began settling here in the mid 1700s. They were so impressed with the area they named it Goshen, after the biblical land of milk and honey. In many ways, the town of Goshen is still the embodiment of bucolic America. There are no grocery store or hotel chains, but there is a general store and a bed and breakfast. Sometimes the only sound to be heard is the trickling of the Calf Pasture River as it winds its way through town toward the Goshen Pass. But just above this stream lies a reminder of another era. This steel bridge harkens back to a time when Goshen was not the placid, idyllic town of today. There were years when the air was filled with the clatter of hoofbeats, the clanking of hammers, and the whistles of steam engines. The first Europeans to settle in the Goshen area soon took notice of the abundance of iron ore in the surrounding hills. Within a few years, furnaces were operating throughout the area. Resources seemed plentiful, but access to major markets was difficult. Transportation was a problem, and it wasn't until 1855 that the railroad came through that put Goshen on the map. When the railroad came, the um, iron industry really took off because they would have spurs leaving from the main railroad line to the iron furnaces, and um, so that really boosted the, the industry. What made Goshen unique was its proximity to the largest of these furnaces, the Victoria Furnace. Al Hodson is a professional engineer who studied the Goshen Bridge while he was a student at the University of Virginia. He has written extensively on Goshen and the bridge for his master's degree and historic preservation certificate. He explains that the Goshen Bridge is the symbol of an industrial boom that opened the eyes of many ambitious investors to the wealth that awaited them in these mountains. The boom was something that was starting all over that part of central and western Virginia. It was businessmen primarily from the Philadelphia area and several from Stanton as well. And they were people who had experience in the steel industry from northern states and businessmen that wanted to make money on the rebirth of the South. It was a great investment scheme and lots of people were caught up in it. It sounded wonderful, um, didn't seem like it could go wrong. And the Goshen Land and Improvement Company was started and they mapped out a little city here in Goshen with all kinds of industries and um, lots for sale. Most of the people, or a good many of the people, were brought in by the Goshen Land and Improvement Company and um, they were potential investors. So they were being wined and dined and shown around. They're going to tell them that they can buy these lots and that everybody's doing it and then in a little time they can sell these lots for much more than they paid for them. They could, you know, double, triple their, their profits. And people believed it. 
So they wanted to capitalize on that source of iron. There were speculators saying, everything that's made of iron and isn't tied up by a patent, we will make here at Goshen. Shares of stock sold quickly, and the boom was in full swing. By the summer of 1891, only a year after the Land and Improvement Company was formed, Gosham was home to car works, an electrical light plant, machine and iron works companies. A rolling mill, bottling plant and brewery were in the near future, and a grand luxury hotel was nearing completion. Setting on a hill with a commanding view of the town, the end would be a testament to the wealth and prosperity to be found in Goshen. They built a beautiful hotel, the Allegheny Hotel, which had hundreds of rooms and cost thousands of dollars and was a, a very grand hotel for its day. And it was located right at the railroad depot as a way to entice speculators into the village. The train was always arriving, bringing guests to the hotel, and it just seemed really lively and fun. Things were happening here. They constructed Maury Avenue, named after Commodore Matthew Fontaine Maury. It was planned to be the grandest boulevard of the South, uh, lit with gas street lamps, and wanting to show everyone the prosperity of this boomtown. The Calf Pasture River bisected Goshen, and a bridge was needed to link the separate parts of town. But the Land and Improvement Company would not have an ordinary structure at the heart of its grand boulevard. The Maury Avenue Bridge must be fitting of the splendor of this new industrial mecca. In the 1800s, bridges were often crude wooden structures intended to last only a few years. They were constructed using limited budgets from localities. State funding was generally not available. The quality of roads and bridges varied greatly from county to county. Constantly exposed to the elements, wooden bridge decks and foundations would soon rot or warp. But by the end of the century, a change was occurring that would revolutionize transportation. You start seeing the wooden bridges, particularly the wooden truss bridges, giving way to the iron bridges, the, the wrought iron and the cast iron, beginning particularly for highway use in the 1870s. And by the end of the 1880s, the early 1890s, and of course the Goshen Bridge is a prime example of this, you have uh, steel coming in. In April 1890, the Rockbridge County Court ordered that a bridge be built across the Calf Pasture River in Goshen. The bridge would serve the horse and carriage traffic using the highway that linked Lexington and Stanton. Later that month, the Goshen Land and Improvement Company was incorporated. In June, the county contracted with the bridge manufacturing company to build the structure for $2,900. Soon afterward, the Land and Improvement Company began to envision this bridge being at the heart of their grand boulevard. If highway traffic passed through Goshen on Maury Avenue, it would take thousands of travelers by the new factories and industries of the thriving town. This could add to Goshen's prestige and allure even more investors and workers. The Land and Improvement Company approached the Rockbridge County Board of Supervisors with a proposal. If the county would give the $2,900 allotted to build the bridge to the Land and Improvement Company, the company would foot the bill for a much stronger and larger structure estimated to cost $7,000. What's more, the company would assume responsibility for the maintenance costs of the bridge. It was an offer county officials couldn't refuse. They envisioned it to be able to carry uh, anything from horse-drawn wagons to streetcars, and the bridge originally even had a six-foot-wide pedestrian lane cantilevered over one side so that you could have foot traffic, you could have rail traffic, and you could have horse and carriage traffic. It was a much wider uh, bridge than normal. Most, most of our old trusses back from that time frame were very narrow one-lane bridges. Yeah, well, the Goshen one was a heavier design truss. I mean, it, it had larger members on it, and it was obviously it was designed for heavier loads than most of our other trusses. Steel was still fairly unusual. It was, the Goshen Bridge was really, it was a high-end bridge. And it had the price tag to prove it. 
When the bridge finally opened, about six months behind schedule, its cost had soared to over $16,000, more than double the estimate. It had taken a year, but the Land and Improvement Company had finally gotten what it wanted. Resting on a foundation of the finest stonework, the Goshen Bridge was as strong and beautiful as the town it would serve. In 1893, there was a banking scandal in Great Britain that caused a panic and depression in the United States. Britain was then the, the center of the world economy, and so the scandal there carried over to the United States, and it was a um, tremendously quick and deep recession and depression. When the um, financial panic of 1893 occurred, um, it hit all of these boom towns in the county very quickly, and um, went, they went from boom to bust in a, in a short while, and, and many people were counting their losses. By 1896, the Rockbridge County Circuit Court ordered the Goshen Land and Improvement Company to sell its real estate to pay debts. It's impossible to tell how many people moved to Goshen at its peak. The boom and bust occurred within three years, and there is no census from the period. Before the boom, about 400 people called Goshen home. That's roughly the population today. After the bust, the town dwindled. Residents left to find jobs and, and more things to do. So it just it was a gradual change. Uh, people left the area, a few little cottage type industries would come in but wouldn't last very long and I would say by 1900 the population had dwindled to maybe um, half of what it was. Without the steady flow of wealthy speculators, even the Grand Allegheny Inn struggled to compete with other resorts in the area such as the homestead. It was sold to um, various people who tried to make a go of it but it just wasn't wasn't happening because people were leaving the area um, and finally a group of foreign doctors bought the hotel and they were going to turn it into a sanatorium for people to come to heal from various ailments. But before the first patient arrived the old inn was reduced to ashes by a fire on Thanksgiving Day 1923. There's speculation that it was burned down on purpose to collect insurance. We don't know that for sure, um, but it was interesting the way it all happened. It happened on Thanksgiving Day around lunchtime when everybody would be away eating. Um, no one would be around to help battle a blaze. And just the timing of it seemed a bit suspicious. With the devastating loss of the hotel, one of the last visible reminders of Goshen's boom years had vanished. The Victoria Furnace, once the largest iron furnace in Virginia, was demolished by 1940. Only 50 years after the boom, the last vestige of the Land and Improvement Company's plans to make Goshen the iron center of America was ironically a steel bridge. It had been the symbol of Goshen's strength, but by the 1940s, it had weakened to the point where it was converted into a single lane bridge, thus limiting the traffic it could carry. By the 1990s, the structure's weight limit had been reduced to six tons. For the families living on the opposite end of the Calf Pasture River, this was a major concern. The bridge was their only link with the main road. Its weight capacity was so low that there was a big problem with emergency vehicles. Even truck that had pumped out a, a, septic, a septic tank. The trunk, uh, a truck could get over the bridge empty, but it could not get over the bridge if it was full. I mean, we had a very small margin of error there and of course the idea that you can, could not get a rescue vehicle or a fire truck over the bridge is a severe public safety issue. With its boomtown origins and skewed design, the Goshen Bridge was particularly unique, but the wear and tear of more than a century of use had taken its toll. The bridge was at a crossroads. It would soon need to be replaced and removed unless it could somehow be restored. It was acknowledged by 
everybody concerned as a very significant historic bridge on, on a number of counts. All of these were points that, that made it a very good candidate. Well, like I say, it's a piece of our history that, that uh, you know, we can't save them all, but it sure is nice to save uh, the few that we can. So that there's, there's some examples of how bridges were built in that era that we keep them around for future generations. Restoring the bridge seemed to be a popular and practical thing to do. But who could take on such a project? At first, the Virginia Department of Transportation looked at the possibility of using a consultant. But few companies do this type of restoration, and there are a number of steel bridges still in use in VDOT Stanton District. Park Thompson had confidence in his fellow engineers and made a bold decision. They would do the restoration work themselves. We kind of felt like, well, why pay somebody else to learn all that, and then they reap the benefit of it. We ought to keep it in-house, and we reap the benefit of learning from it. It just paid off. We learned a lot from it. We haven't really tackled anything quite as extensively as that before. We've done some restoration work on some of our other trusses, but we never had to take them completely down like we did Goshen. I mean, Goshen, we took it down piece by piece. Before they could be restored, the bridge members had to be sandblasted to remove the rust and old lead paint. The results were plain to see, but there was still much work to be done. Some of the pieces had deteriorated past the point of restoration. The 110-year-old bridge would need some new parts, and no blueprints of the structure were known to have survived. We had to get up and measure every piece and every angle and every inch of that thing to, to create a plan for it. You know, before we could do the, the restoration plan, we had to do a pretty thorough job of documenting just what was there. Stanton District Engineer Robbie Softley had to start from scratch. He would have to recreate the 19th century bridge using 21st century technology and computer programs. That wasn't the only hurdle he faced. We didn't want to put anything in the stream so that if a flood came up and we were partially disassembled, the entire structure would simply wash downstream. So we devised a, an internal false work system of three beams uh, and then we put bents near the existing piers and abutments so that the stream would remain open. The structure is on the National Register of Historic Places, so whatever we did, we had to preserve the appearance of the structure. Uh, we couldn't destroy the elements of the truss. It still had to function as a truss. And that's one thing as structural engineers that we were insisting upon ourselves. Naturally, with this structure, we had to dig out some old textbooks and, and, and blow the dust off of them and look at some of the way that the original designers had intended this thing to function. So it was a, a collaborative effort by the design team. We, we made some calls to some fabricators. Uh, I made some calls to some bolt manufacturers. And, and uh, we actually sent out a few of, the, of our concepts of, of how we envisioned this thing to work to the fabricators and got their input uh, and then we produced the contract drawings uh, based on their input also. The Stanton District Office worked with Structural Steel Products of Clayton, North Carolina. With the aid of Robbie Softley's numbers, steel pieces were cut to match those used on the Goshen Bridge. For Mike Cumber, working on the structure presented a unique set of challenges, but he soon developed an affection for this icon of the Victorian age. We didn't have any original blueprints from this particular project, but you go back and look at some of the calculations that people had to do by hand, and it's almost like artwork. It's incredibly unique because we've never worked on a 100-year-old bridge before that I know of. We've done a lot of uh, refurbishing of, of older structures, but never anything quite as historic. Using our new technology to match up to a hundred year old steel is a challenge. Anytime you're trying to make a, a new piece in the image of an old piece, it's uh, you have to be careful. <laughs> the pain in the neck comes when they start shipping parts and you know the guys are gonna be out there putting it up and me, I, I'm a worry wart, so I'm always you know, sitting around chewing my nails until things actually up. Our average bridge is a pretty humdrum thing, so it's nice to have a little excitement, you know, being able to put back something the way it used to be and preserve some history. 
it's just kind of quaint. It, the design is um, just so unique in that it's it's actually pretty to look at instead of just being a, a plain, typical eye-shaped girder. Painting the bridge would have prevented the rust and corrosion, but this was a costly and labor-intensive alternative. The constant work required to maintain steel bridges led to their decline in popularity. To protect the Goshen Bridge from the elements, VDOT decided to have the old steel galvanized. The members were sent to Galvan Industries near Charlotte, even disassembled, the pieces of the historic bridge made an impression on Dave Pryor. They were very old, very old. Some of the steel in Goshen, uh, I'd never seen anything quite like that. It was more, uh, more iron than steel. A lot of the pieces were so old, in fact, that you could see light through them. Uh, required some very special handling and cleaning. It goes first through a, a caustic bath to remove oil and organic contaminants from the surface. It uh, then goes through a rinse and then to an acid bath. We use sulfuric acid in a dilute solution. From there it's rinsed again and goes into a, a final cleaning operation of a pre-flux. From, from the, the fluxing operation, the steel is allowed to dry for a short period, and then it's immersed in a bath of molten zinc metal, thereby the name hot dip galvanizing. Uh, our bath is maintained at a temperature between 845 and 850 degrees Fahrenheit, and the steel is allowed to remain in the galvanizing bath until it reaches the temperature of the kettle, at which point, at which point it forms a distinct iron-zinc alloy called hot dip galvanizing. Uh, upon withdrawal from the galvanizing bath, pure zinc is deposited on the surface. That's the me mechanical deposition portion of the coating. Um, it's the portion of the coating that pe people typically associate with the bright, shiny spangle of a galvanized coating. Um, from there, it's immersed into a bath essentially of water uh, with sodium dichromate added to it as a passivator to final rinse, uh, to wash any ash off the surface, and to cool the steel down until it's put on the finishing benches where our finishers go through with files or grinders to remove any small defects on the surface, and the process is complete. With its shiny new coat, the bridge was now ready to return home. Just as in 1890, the structure was assembled on site, piece by piece. Modern machinery made the task easier, but sometimes the best tool is an old-fashioned sledgehammer. Sporting a new galvanized coating, the historic bridge defies its age. Even the stone piers were given a makeover. A new wooden deck was laid, opening the bridge to two lanes of traffic for the first time in about 60 years. One, two, three. <laughs> Following a ceremony, the restored bridge was formally reopened. Fittingly, the first vehicle to cross was a truck from the Goshen Volunteer Fire Department. Virginia was once home to several hundred steel bridges. Now there are less than 250. They represent a revolutionary era in transportation engineering. Like their predecessors, the wooden covered bridges, these steel structures are museum pieces scattered across the Virginia landscape. They evoke a sense of history, nostalgia, and sometimes awe.
you know, most of them were from a horse and buggy time. They, you know, it's amazing. You have, you have to admire those trusses. They, they performed extremely well. When you look at how modern traffic has treated them, you know, the loads that we put on were probably far greater than was they were ever thought of carrying when they were designed and built. They've performed admirably. It's really amazing they've taken what they have. Now that it has been restored, the Goshen Bridge will be around to amaze another generation of engineers and travelers alike. It crosses more than just the Calf Pasture River. The Goshen Bridge spans centuries. It will probably last 50, 60, maybe 100 years with no maintenance. Barring a uh, tremendous and unforeseen uh, disaster, that bridge should uh, be ready to celebrate its 200th anniversary, I think. I'm hoping it'll still be around long after I'm gone, and I'm hoping my generation, uh, my grandchildren and, and people will be able to use it. And I think that's one thing that makes it uh, very satisfying, that you, you've left a little piece of yourself around for people to enjoy. So it was a very rewarding project. I mean, it will last virtually longer than I will. <laughs> you know, so.